And something I was just thinking about now while I was sitting here talking to you is, are there any airlines that still allow smoking on planes? I'm gonna Google it. Oh, there's a few. It is Sunday, January 28th, 2024. And on this week's edition of Sunday Sofa Time, we're talking about smoking on airplanes. I'm Morgan from the very unofficial travel guides. I've been making travel videos for over 15 years of popular and not so popular tourist destinations to give you a very honest, unofficial look at what it's like to be there. And in addition to the travel vlogs that I post here on YouTube, every Sunday I sit down here in my living room for a relaxed chat about some travel related topic. And this week we're gonna talk about the times where you could smoke on an airplane. So sit back, relax, grab your cigarettes, and let's get into this. On the Facebook page for the very unofficial travel guides, I posted this meme the other day, uh, just as a funny way to talk about getting older. By the way, I'm recording this yesterday, the 27th, and today is Marcus's birthday. Speaking of getting older. So just right now in the comments below, let me know if you are of a generation or the generation where you experienced smoking in airplanes. If you have, you're also the generation where you experienced people being able to like walk to the gate with you who were not on the flight, watch you board the flight, and then watch the plane leave and go take off from inside the airport. Definitely can't do that anymore either, but which one would you rather have again? Smoking in planes or people being able to come with you to the gate? I know which one I want. And I am going to list some facts now, which is very off brand for the very unofficial travel guides. And some of these numbers are surprising and some not. For instance, uh, according to Wikipedia, it says here United Airlines created a non-smoking section in 1971. And I was surprised because I thought, okay, I thought the smoking ban came way later than that, but they're talking about just having a section inside the airplane where people couldn't smoke and like that's gonna do anything. I just can't believe that there were times times that I experienced where you could be sitting in a plane and the person next to you is smoking a cigarette or even a cigar in an airplane. Continuing here with the facts from Wikipedia, it says in 1994, Delta was the first US airline to ban smoking on all worldwide flights. So 1994, that's only 30 years ago. Interestingly enough, there were people fighting against the ban. It's not a surprise. Nowadays, anything that makes money is fought for, even if it's horrible for you. It says here, in the United States, both tobacco companies and airlines fought any regulation. In 1976, the US Civil Aeronautics Board banned cigar and pipe smoking on aircraft. Cigars are so stinky and nasty. And if you wanna smoke a cigar, I don't mean to be like cigar shaming you, but it should be something that you do alone around only people who wanna smell it and definitely someplace where nobody else can smell it. There's only a few places I can think of where it would be even more impolite to smoke a cigar, like maybe inside a telephone booth with another person. Speaking of things that don't exist anymore, in 1984, the chairman of the Civil Aeronautics Board said, philosophically, I think non-smokers have rights, but it comes into marked conflict with practicalities and the realities of life. Thank you, Dan McKinnon. And it wasn't until 1987 that, at least in the US, a congressional action led to a ban on in-flight smoking. But first, it was only on flights of less than two hours. So if the flight was longer than two hours, you could still spark one up. In 1990, the ban was increased and it says here it was applied to the passengers and cabin of the aircraft, but not the flight deck. Pilots were allowed to continue smoking after the 1990 ban due to concerns over potential flight safety issues caused by nicotine withdrawal in chronic smokers. 
I'm just gonna continue. This video is sponsored by the book, Getting Stitches on a Cruise Ship, written by me. It tells a little bit about what my life was like before I started making videos full time, and then there are 10 true stories of actual things that have happened to me while traveling around the world, like when I had to get stitches on a cruise ship. It's available on Amazon now, and it's a great way to support what I do here on YouTube. By the way, in reading this article and studying up to make this video, I found out something that I've always been curious about. Why are there still ash trays in airplanes? And I'll tell you right now. It says here, despite a prohibition of smoking, the US Federal Aviation Administration regulations mandate that functioning ashtrays be conspicuously located on the doors of all airplane bathrooms this is because there must be a safe place to dispose of a lit cigarette if someone violates the no smoking rule. So that's why they still make ashtrays in airplanes. I always thought it was because Delta buys a bunch of new planes and then they kind of reach the end of their lifespan for the quality that Delta likes to provide, which seems to be a very long time. But I thought it was so that if they sell it to another airline where they still allow smoking, then it was already set up for that. But it's not that. It's so that if somebody is stupid enough to light up a cigarette on a plane nowadays, they have an actual ashtray where they can put it out. Who knew? Interestingly enough here, it says in 1994, Canada was the first country to ban smoking on all flights operated by Canadian carriers, which also covered charter flights, but not foreign airlines flying into Canada. It's interesting when I go through quickly just some of the other facts here. It says that uh, in 1998 in Japan, smoking was banned on all domestic flights, but up until 1998 or between uh, 1988 and 1998, it was only banned on flights of one hour or less. And it's like, honestly, people, if you can't go more than an hour without a cigarette or, you know, anything like that, might be time to talk to somebody about it. It seems like the different countries and different airlines started with a ban of flights then less than one hour, less than two hours, less than six hours, and then around... Yeah, in the 90s, like around 1994, 95, even up here, British Airways, 1998. That's when a full-on blanket ban happened everywhere, 1998. And something I was just thinking about now while I was sitting here talking to you is, are there any airlines that still allow smoking on planes? I'm gonna Google it. Oh. There's a few. According to aircharteradvisors.com, a few international airlines such as Air Algeria, Cubana, and Iran Air still allow smoking in certain sections on their flights, which is why most of the signage remains on domestic airliners today. Here's an interesting fact that this article says that e-cigarettes and vape pens, the federal, what, what is FAA again? Federal Aeronautics Administration has banned the use of e-cigarettes during commercial flights, and they are still updating their regulations regarding air travel and e-cigarettes, although one may assume they are permitted during during private air travel, please check with your representatives to verify that e-cigarettes and vape pens are owner approved to avoid potential issues during your flight. So all my friends out there who are chartering private flights, first of all, will you adopt me? And second of all, don't assume just because you're on a private jet, you can also use a vape pen or smoke. Apparently, there are still regulations that govern over private flights too. Okay, I have a theoretical question for you that I'm very curious to hear what you have to say about it. Let's say you're planning travel someplace and you're looking at flights and we have two direct flights, one with airline A and one with airline B. Airline A has a flight that will get you there at a perfect time, and the price for this flight is, let's say, $650. Airline B offers basically the same flight, just leaving a couple minutes later. The price is only $350, so like half, but there's a smoking section on the plane. Which flight would you book? The cheap one where people are gonna be smoking or the more expensive one where people wouldn't be smoking. I cannot imagine under any circumstances nowadays wanting to be 
in a plane where people are smoking, even if it's just an hour flight? Nope, not gonna happen. Doesn't matter how cheap it is. I mean, I have done so many international flights now where I'm sitting in the same airplane for eight, nine, 10 hours, and even with no smoke in the air, the eyes be burning, the nose is irritated, the lips are chapped. And I just think if people were smoking in there and smoking cigars and pipes, ugh, ugh, ugh. I would definitely travel a lot less or maybe not at all. As always, let me know what you think about all this. Let me know if you wish you could still smoke in an airplane. I enjoy reading your comments. And speaking of comments, now comes the time on Sunday Sofa Time where I comment on your comments live on air. In last week's Sunday Sofa Time, I went through a play-by-play, day-by-day review of our experience cruising on the Celebrity Equinox. These comments are on that video. The first one is from somebody whose main handle is Martha Littenberg. For some reason, in the YouTube Creators app, the name on the comments is always different than what it shows up when you just look at the comments on YouTube. So Martha, I'm sure you know I mean you. Martha writes, did you contact housekeeping about your cabin? They can't fix it if you don't let them know. I have been on Equinox several times and have never had any problems with asking housekeeping to take care of things in my cabin. So if you've watched my cabin tour or this uh, sort of like review of the entire cruise experience, you'll see that even though Celebrity kind of markets itself as being a little bit upscale, there were some major issues in our cabin. And Martha's wording is, did you contact housekeeping so they can fix it? And I have to say, for me, fixing something is when, like when something goes wrong. These are things that should not even have been there in the first place. You know what I mean? Like there shouldn't be somebody else's hairs all over the seat. There shouldn't be somebody else's toenails on the floor. There should not be somebody's sneeze or paint or whatever that is running down the door frame. If the cabin steward was doing his or her, her job correctly, none of that would have been there. So I don't feel like it's my responsibility to report that. If somebody's coming in to clean the cabin, then they should be cleaning the cabin. They should see, oh, what is this on the door? I definitely need to wipe that away. They should take the hairs away. They should vacuum the carpet so there aren't toenails there. And if you wanna hear what I ended up doing or not doing, then go check out those videos. I talk all about it there. Next comment is from Becca Carrillo. Becca writes, the state of that cabin made me gag. Wear and tear is one thing, but stuff that's dripped down the door frame and long black hair? Uh-uh. Next time, and I hope it doesn't happen, but just in case, please let guest services know. And if that seems too confrontational, speak to your cabin steward and let him or her know that they must have gotten interrupted before they could finish your cabin and that they would do it now, please. They're generally wonderful at getting cabins ready for new guests, so something must have happened to keep them from properly turning yours. And yeah, I mean, talked about this in the other videos. I just didn't wanna get anybody in trouble. And I mean, yes, I wanted a clean cabin. I do pay for all my trips. I don't get invitations from the cruise lines to cruise for free. But still, I don't know. I just, these were like kind of major issues and I just didn't want anybody to like get busted. Know what I mean? But yeah, I guess technically I could have just grabbed the cabin steward and talked to him directly and been like, um, dude, what is this? What is this? What is this? Probably should have done that. And final comment on my video reviewing our entire experience on the Equinox is from Charles Rowland, who sounds like he had similar experience. He says, we've been on the Equinox twice. Both times it was evident that this ship needs a major refresh. I mean, major. There is plenty of rust showing through the paint on the balcony. The railings are very worn, it's just bare wood. Interior curtains were threadbare in the folds. Furniture worn. On one cruise, a metal extension that kept the balcony glass partition in place fell off, leaving the glass partition swinging back and forth in the wind. I called for maintenance. They sent the room steward. He just reinstalled it. And the next day, it fell off again. I reinstalled it and secured it with some packing tape I had in my carry-on. I will not cruise on this ship again. Yeah, it's too bad. Equinox is actually a really nice ship but it kind of seems like Celebrity 
Just stop caring about it. A lot of people wrote in the comments that it, it is going into dry dock soon, so maybe they're just kind of letting all the issues, they're just letting the wounds fester because they know it's getting amputated soon anyways. Ew, what a disgusting analogy. Why did I come up with that? Sorry. Speaking of cruising and cruise reviews, the next videos here on the very unofficial travel guides are gonna be all about my experience on the Royal Caribbean Independence of the Seas. Also not the newest ship, but was it better? Was it worse than the Equinox? There were also some surprises. Hashtag dirty cabin. If you're subscribed and have the notification bell clicked, then you'll know when those videos go online or just check back soon. I'm Morgan from the very unofficial travel guides. See you then.